still understand, um, I think to some extent, um, the source of the problem, but also the opportunity um, that, uh, that Ronan Crowley was going to talk about. Now, his topic is migrating the new text and document in Ulysses, a digital, critical, and synoptic edition. Well, thanks very much, Ronan. Um, I have a few pages of to be read, but then from there I'll uh, switch over to more freeform, workshoppy style. But there we have one book called Ulysses. Can you all see from right here? Um, so the first edition of Joyce's novel came with a disclaimer. This was initialed SB for Sylvia Beach, Joyce's publisher. It was actually written by Joyce himself. Um, because they have a version in his handwriting in Buffalo. The publisher asks the reader's indulgence for typographical errors unavoidable in the exceptional circumstances. <coughs> and Ulysses is long considered simply uneditable. Um, but the cause of critically editing the novel was furthered considerably in the late 1970s by the publication of um, facsimile editions of all of Joyce's drafts, fair copies, uh, typescripts and proofs that were then known to be extant. A lot of other material has turned up actually in the last 15 years, about as much again material for Ulysses in terms of drafts. But um, so in 1978, fortified by a grant from the German Research Foundation, Hans Walter Gadler set about the mammoth task of critically editing Joyce's great novel. So if we fast forward six years, Three volume, Ulysses, a critical and synoptic edition, was presented to Stephen James Joyce, the author's grandson, at the Frankfurt Joyce Symposium in 1984. So, in the process, the first edition, this went to the critical and synoptic edition. Um, so, each set of facing pages there, you have both editions in each opening. Um, the text of the critical edition, or the reading text of Ulysses, basically, is on the right and on the left we have uh, the corresponding portion of the synoptic edition of um, each episode. What's the synoptic edition? So it's not synopsis in the sense of like a condensed statement, right, giving us an overview, but rather synoptic or synopsis in the sense of overlaying and simultaneous presentation. Um, so if we look even at just the first page here, what the edition does is um, layer all the sections of this portion of the text on top of one another and almost like uh, flag the moments of difference and give them these superscripts that tell you on what level of Joyce's work at that portion of the text this change was made. So level four, he added in the sentence, three strong trill whistles answered through the calm. That sentence was added. He subsequently went back, once that had been set by a printer, and changed three to two. Right? Here's a richer page here from a bit later in the book. Right? But you can see, if not necessarily get straight away, right, the amount of work that Joyce is inflicting on a given paragraph of the novel. Right. This is all changes that he's making to the book after um, its fair copy state has been arrived at. So we don't have the kind of tumultuous false starts and tryouts of early stage work on an episode. They've all achieved a state of completion. And these are um, incremental accretions to that completion. The book is, it functions as a novel without any of these changes. Right? But this is uh, during the process of proofreading, Joyce added about a third of the novel in these incremental uh, phases of revision and reworking and elaboration. Um, we don't usually make editions like this anymore. Right? Synoptic presentation kind of tests the limits of paper. Right? And in the digital dimension, we don't have those uh, shortcomings. Right? But we kind of are faced with the, the challenge of having um, a very data-rich edition that favours, let's say, an outmoded theoretical perspective. 
right? What do we do with an addition like that? Do we try to drag it kicking and screaming into the edge of digital documentary editing, or do we try to meet halfway with its preference for synoptic presentation? The latter is what I'm going for. Um, and at this three-volume edition that's circulating, that's, um, that's the lesser achievement, as it were. Um, it's a mere print output of what was a larger digital enterprise in the 1970s and 80s, because the critical and synoptic edition was among the earliest projects to enlist the systematic aid of the computer in the storage and collation processes. Um, the 84 Ulysses represents then a pioneering effort in digital scholarly editing, and its aim at the time was nothing less than the reconstruction of Ulysses as Joyce wrote it. So a lot of the um, material culture of the edition still survives, I think, in Halthoff Gatner's basement in Munich, but they used punch card technology to store this information and input, um, I think, large format typescripts into the 70s version of OCR. Right? So a lot of that material still survives, but really it's the data that they that they collected and collated and gathered together that we want to um, give a further lease of life to. Right? Um, and the edition was being developed working with this two-step suite of text processing tools. And that was then, it was in the initial stages of its development in Germany in Tübingen. Um, so there's the result you know, of a front page. There's a whole project history to be carved out here. What I want to address, though, this afternoon are the efforts ongoing since the late 1990s to migrate data that was originally produced in two-step um, to the retreating horizon of the state of the art, right? the state of the digital scholarly editing art. Um, this is the kind of expanded timeline then, and here's the personnel who uh, work on Ulysses Digital Critical and Synoptic Edition, DCSE. I'm just going to talk about some recent project history of this long-lived edition and give some projections for its future development. Um, I want to talk you through some of the challenges and opportunities of migrating data through successive iterations of the text encoding initiatives, encoding standards or guidelines. And um, maybe most fundamentally though, recent work on the DCSE represents a shift to the kind of tailored digital environment that Elena Perazzo dubs a haute couture edition, right? <laughs> one built with the contributions of a meaningful collaboration between scholarly editors and developers. Um, okay, but um, by the time I started work on this Ulysses data, I was late in the summer of 2014, the, the edition's genetic information had already gone through three major migrations or conversions. Right, here it is here. There was initial, an initial conversion from a grandchild of the two-step files to TEI SGL, SGML. That's the P3 conversion. That was overseen by Tobias Rescher in 1997. He also converted that data to P4 once TEI switched to XML. That was in 2002. And then, um, just before my collaborator and I came on board, Greg Bidel in Germany led an initial quick migrate of P4 to P5. How, uh, how often TEI? I think you'll need to explain so. Okay, as we go along then. Okay, well, basically, here's what happened. Um, we, um, the Synoptic Edition went from its print instantiation to these episode specific TDI XML files. That's essentially how it was done. Um, and now we have our 18 episode specific files um, with a lot of header or metadata. Right, describing features and attributes of the documents that are behind it, and we have some JSON for our visualizations. <coughs> and the whole thing sits in an exist database where it does the work of turning it into HTML for display in a web browser, right, which looks something like this. We don't have a great land page or anything like that yet, and there's very little scholarly edition apparatus up there just yet. Right, that's probably still have a password protected site, but um, eventually all those um, introductory material appear alongside the edition. Um, maybe I'll skip that, but our challenge then is there's been a shift in the um, editorial emphasis. 
right? We're dealing with data that was prepared under the aegis of a very different conception of the possibilities for uh, an addition like this that would show and would chart change um, over time, the development of a work over time. Right? We want to uh, hold on to that data, but to make it a bit more um, compatible with current editorial perspectives and um, the possibilities of the digital media. Um, so the task that I and my collaborator face was and is to migrate this legacy data um, to current encoding standards. So the issues that we encountered, detection, measurement, uh, reversal of migration loss. Right? This material uh, was created in the 70s and 80s. It's been through several whole-scale conversions since then. And over that time, the information that it captures has degraded right? in the process of batch migration. Um, we also wanted to know the efficiency of kind of manually keyed over just uh, batch XSLT correction. Right? Do you need a team of people to find the errors, or can you find types of errors and tell your computer to fix it? Um, and then here's the theoretical question for us. The commensurability or otherwise of inter-document critical synopsis. In other words, Gabler's chosen presentation form um, limited by paper, the commensurability of that with the current preference for single document editing, right, which of course is a function of um, what we can do on the screen right, and closely tied to it. And related to this, we have a two step hangover, right, its technical name, which is caused by importing or inheriting <coughs> two step specific solutions to problems that actually don't exist in XML. Uh, and finally, we're interested in just the possibilities for uh, new knowledge enabled by data visualization of the endpoint GDI. Um, it says here now I get a bit more free form. So uh, I'll just talk initially about some of our inherited markup. Right? I'll go very quickly through it maybe. But here's, um, here's an image of a placard that was posed in late 1921 and sent to Joyce from Dijon. You can see like um, Enno Morkin on proofs He's catching um, errors, right? Auction rooms should be one word, right? He's saying, no, make this a uh, lowercase w, right? But what Joyce does that most writers don't do is he adds a lot to the text on these um, proof documents, on these documents of transmission. I don't have an exact figure, but it's supposed to be about a third of Ulysses is written on the proofs, right? And in the last six to seven months of his work on the book that, you know, its final line says 1914 to 1921. Most of the book was written in the last year and a half. Right? But if we look at even just this corner here, here's, here's the change. The text has in its uh, typeset state, a somber young man, comma. He makes a carrot mark in F, and then in the margin says YMCA. So it's going to be a somber YMCA young man, right? With a kind of great redundancy. Um, this is what that looks like in the synoptic edition. Right? This is a change made on level one, right? which is an editorial abstraction for the first time that Joyce saw this material in proof. Right? And the carrots surrounding it tell you it's an insert, and then the superscript number gives you the level that, it was, <coughs> that the change was made on. Um, here's the encoding that we inherited for that. Is that on, on the try and parse it? <laughs> Any TEI mandrins? <laughs> well, I'll show you the encoding that we now follow, that we came up with. Right. Uh, I don't know if the color balance is working perfectly, but you, you can see there that it, now we have, it's a change that was added and it specifies the level. Right. Uh, and here's the text that was made, that was added, YMCA. The older model actually <coughs> treats all the levels as though they're witnesses to um, textual transmission in a very different editorial tradition, right? Which says all of these witnesses are equal and you're creating a lemma and a reading. Rather than saying, no, these different versions um, are one after the other. 
right? So the change made on level one is in all subsequent levels, unless mm -hmm. there's a mistake made by the printer, right? So rather than a model of, um, let's say, this is a kind of, um, takes a step back from making any claim about the relationships between these documents, right? But they're all encoded in our metadata, which tells us level one, it level <coughs> one, Estragonians level one uh, was active in August 1921, and this is changes made to placards in August 1921. It's our description of it. And each level of the text gets an entry like that that tells us details about dates, um, the document type, and also puts them in a chronology. Right. Okay. Um, here's the difference that we have made to it. Might look minimal, but what we've done here is we've put in the actual document name. These levels that I've been talking about are an editorial abstraction, which has come up with to make the edition. But behind this editorial abstraction are always these physical documents that were running through Joyce's hands, right? So you take clusters of them and say, this is all level one, this is all level two, because they represent successive stages of work on that portion of the text. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Right? But here now we've put in the, um, just a very slight reference to the actual physical document, right? Some marker that uh, allows us to point to it whenever we want to. And that's actually the, the basis of our reconciliation between synoptic presentation and more document-focused editorial work. That does all the work for us. Right? So that for any given um, line in the synoptic presentation, we can always invoke the material document on which that change is made and which the text has been abstracted from in Gabler's presentation. Does that work? Yeah. And that, that's the kind of... Um, rationale behind the tools that we've been developing for our edition, which I'll, I'll start showing at this stage. Okay, so, you know, it's just one little corner of this. I mean, it's not this size, but it's a pretty big piece of paper at the same time. Um, and each of these changes is a level one change within the synoptic edition, but now we have information about the physical document, and the next stage would be information about the placement on that document. Here's just another example of the same kind of phenomenon. Um, R is the, the reading on the manuscript, Rosenbach manuscript, it was just an R, which Joyce expanded on the, um, later on the same document to Reuben. So every document following that has that change. But I'm just talking here about the redundancy that was built into the DEI that we inherited. So it's a bit cleaner at this stage. Um, one of the reasons why uh, this material looked like this was because it had never been visualized. You know, the, the conversions were done by people um, who were, um, let's say, lending a hand rather than part of a team building an edition. So the first thing that we started to do was, me and my collaborator in Passau, we started just visualizing the TEI that we had in a browser. And straight away then, we could see the sorts of errors that were sitting in it uh, because of several decades of conversion to very different technologies. Right? So here, for example, it, it looks like a minor issue, but all the line breaks have been picked up and put in the wrong place. Right? So part of the work that we're doing is, is actually just going through the edition in this kind of presentation and finding those errors and going and uh, correcting them. You know, so you can imagine it's quite a bit of labor. Um, there's our central issue. Right. The, the types of mistakes that were caused by um, migration. If you have an army of encoders, you could just set them loose on the corpus and tell them to fix every issue. We don't have an army and we, don't, we didn't have an army. So we have to find types of mistakes, types of issues, and then figure out more automated ways of tackling them. Right. But there still is a lot of manual cut and paste to get it looking like um, this, right? This is the um, synoptic presentation, and the first thing we did was we changed it that you can also use the line numbers of Gabler's edition that are 
the uh, canonical reference system in Joyce Scholarship. Right. Um, this is again the opening of Vestragonians. I'll actually just switch for a second to uh, the edition. So when I'm in the episode, right, this is um, a HTML output of all that markup. I can turn off, sorry, I can turn off the synoptic markup and just look at an individual <coughs> level within that. The default is the fair copy. Here we're just looking at the text of the fair copy, but it has imposed on it the line breaks of the uh, standard reading edition. If we look at another layer. Let's look at it. Here we're just looking at that document. This doesn't mean we have transcribed all the documents and they're sitting behind it. Right? What our code does is on the fly, it goes and just extracts one given level of, um, of the episode. Right? making any of the changes that precede that, putting them into the text, and just getting rid of anything that comes after it. Right? But one of our tasks to make this more documentary would be to put in line breaks of the material documents. So here's the first page of the manuscript of Lestragonians, which is now in Philadelphia. Right? If we want ours to look like that, Someone has to do that. <laughs> <laughs> this is one sheet of maybe a 30 sheet episode of 18 episodes. Right? Um, we, we faked it for one page. <laughs> right? But ideally when you changed your view to look at just one version within all of those synoptic versions, you would get something like lineation for free. Right. But, you know, who's going to do that work? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we'll compromise it just page by page initially. Right. But again, some of it has to be team done, I suppose. Um, I just then want to look at this again to show you another issue that we've inherited from the edition. So, let's even slow down, just see what's going on somewhere like here. Um, D is a change made on a TypeScript, right? So this line, the manuscript read, his slow feet walked in riverward reading, all were washed in the blood of the Lamb. On the TypeScript, he made this change, add in the words, are you saved? So then every document after that had that set in the base text, right? That's the principle of synoptic presentation. Can anyone tell me what's the problem with this here? So it's, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, right? What has, what does the synoptic presentation think Joyce has done? What is it, what is it telling you Joyce has done here? Sorry? Changed periods to exclamation? Yeah, so, so what he actually has done is changed a period to exclamation points. What is the, uh, this presentation telling you he has done? So the words, it is there three times, yeah, the, the whole word, mm -hmm. what do you mean? Yeah, as if he crossed out coming full stop mm -hmm. and wrote coming exclamation mark, right, three times, right? Instead, the points were just turned, he added a, a single dash rather than crossed out entire sentences of his um, manuscript, in this case, right? Do, do people get what we're talking about here? It's the issue of tokenization, right? Where do you break your units? Um, here's uh, an example from the first page. Stephen stood up and went over to the parapet. Leaning on it, he looked down on the water. Opposite, <coughs> cross out water, water, and on the mail boat clearing the uh, harbour mouth of Kingstown. Right. Here's the um, manuscript. Right. This line here was added by the printer. But, um, 
you can see the addition, mm. and on the mailboard, clearing the harbour mast at Kingstown, which was just leaning on it. He looked down on the water, and there's just Joyce has just put an F card mark there, and he writes his addition above it. Right? In other words, it's just an insert. It's just an addition that's been made. So what we have inherited kind of skews mm. the balance of um, Joyce's work on the book, right? That lots of things that are these really neat inserts that literally go between a word and full stop, and maybe add 50 words, have been framed as moments of substitution. That he went and crossed out something and wrote something entirely different. But actually, if you start to um, change these, you see that the text of Ulysses was so kind of accommodating at this moment that he could just nudge apart, you know, a word and its accompanying punctuation mark and insert reams of material, right? Whole sentences, maybe not whole characters, but certainly dialogue and, and full scenes. So maybe I'll show you one of our solutions to this using the uh, Wolf resource. Um, Yeah. Okay, so um, <coughs> so that's the state that our Ulysses markup is in, the equivalent of this. This is a, an edition of a Sketch of the Past, a very short wolf fragment um, that has been, uh, I think there's only a, one manuscript and a typescript that survive of it, but we've, we have them here in the same synoptic presentation. Right. But why it's particularly interesting is because Wolf did the typing herself. So she introduces lots of changes in the course of retyping. So in other words, there's a lot of revision going on uh, between the document borders, as it were. For our purposes, can you see there uh, even just the first sentence? What's, what are the changes that are actually happening, and what is the synoptic presentation <coughs> doing with them? Does anyone want to call it? I will. Yeah. So, uh, in line two, thinking comma is, uh, in fact, the comma is deleted. Thinking isn't rewritten. Yeah. That's the same point as your point with water. <coughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it carries on, where this time channel is capitalised. The green, we could say, is her typing, right? Everything in black appears in both versions, right? But the material in green is Wolf reading her own manuscript and making small and not so small changes as she types it out, right? But because the token at this moment is the word and whatever punctuation is attached to it, we're telling you that she kind of crossed out thinking comma and instead wrote thinking, right? She crossed out channel lowercase c and wrote channel uppercase c, right? So a much neater kind of presentation of this is here. Even it's not perfect, right? You'll see. But I mean, uh, so the uh, comma on thinking is, let's say, flagged as it's going to change between versions, right? We don't manage to catch the C, the capitalization of channel here, right? Because our first run through the corpus is just look at the last character. Is the rest of the word the same, but the trailing punctuation is different, right? So it's a kind of um, a strategy that means you, you find one solution, terminal punctuation, you implement it, now we uh, come up with the next issue, which will be initial capitals. We'll address it, then there'll be others like uh, uh, as I ought was in brackets, get rid of the brackets, as I ought, comma. Right? So you need a different set of strategies to capture all the different cases that you have in order to get beyond this issue of tokenization, which was entirely inherited from two-step. It's not something you'd have to deal with if you started the project in TEI. Right? Sometimes this whole talk could be called, why not start again? Why not start, <laughs> again? Why not start the entire project again? Right? So in 25 years or like 40 years, the next team the tackles can also start again. Um, Okay, so here's just an example from our corpus. Brilliantly, it's the moment where Bloom's on the toilet, but you can see here 
patiently, full stop. Our markup currently says he crossed out patiently and rewrote patiently. But of course, what he's actually doing is taking that um, largely invariant paragraph and just building it up over successive layers of, a, of a rework. Right? And eventually, we will have these moments of um, substitution reworked as additions. Right? As we get to a, as we shift the addition to a closer approximation of what Chelsea is up to. Uh, do people have the energy for our transpositions? Or do you want to march beyond them in all their glory? <laughs> transpositions time. are troublesome. <laughs> Um, here's a line of synoptic presentation, right? Which I, maybe I won't even comment on. I'll show you just what it what it tries to capture. It's this line here, right? This is why this kind of presentation, the synoptic <coughs> presentation format, is great for dealing with a text in the later stages of its development when it's achieved. Um, a general coherence, right? In other words, when you have a, a typesetter setting, or when you have a typist typing a stable, relatively stable text, synoptic presentation comes into its own. But even just to get this moment here, where Joyce writes, his hand fell back to his side, right? Is it then his hand fell again? So there's an instance of overwrite there, right? But there's a, a second change where he's gone 2, 1, which is an instruction, swap these two words. Right? So the kinds of things you can accomplish with your pencil, you know, the kind of indications you can give to a typist with your pencil in a few seconds are, are just beyond um, synoptic markup. Right? It decides, he wrote, his hand fell again to his side, cross out all of that, then write, Back, no, not back, right, again to his side, again. Right. <laughs> so in other words, even to understand this example, we had to take out our um, printed copy of the Rosenbach manuscript and start studying it to see what was actually going on on the page. Right. Transpositions are still not something we've, we've sorted. Right. We're still not sure what to do with them. I think it's lots of projects struggle with this issue, right, where material is... Deleted and added, but actually neither. It's a move. Right? How do you encode it, first of all, and then how do you represent it in something like the addition? Here's just another example like that. This is from um, near the start of uh, Telemachus, near the start of the book, right? where cleft by a crooked crack, and then there's a carrot mark that says hair on end. Right? That should be easy. Insert those words there. Right? But there's another carrot mark, which was here, and was crossed out of here. So it looks like he's instructing the typist to put it in here. They said, oh, no, no, actually, no, wait, hold on. Scratch, literally scratched it out. You can see it's very faint. And then um, added it in here. Here's the um, synoptic presentation solution for that. Uh, hair on end. Um, hair on end. Right. So we need something uh, <coughs> a bit more robust, a bit more versatile than um, the solutions that were taken by the synoptic edition, even as we try to port over its encoding to more um, representative. So here's the issue for us. We have very little documentation on the material. That's why we ended up going back to things like the printed volumes from the 70s. Right? I mean the printed facsimile volumes, to see what, what are these instances of uh, synoptic presentation trying to capture and record. We shouldn't have to do that in the project, right? But the flip side of it was we read even less, right? So it's not entirely the uh, precursors to our works, probably, our fault. Uh, I'll switch to being on my knees, in fact. I'll just drive through the edition for a few minutes. Um, Maybe show you some of the tools that we developed. Um, maybe if we look at so what you have here is it's episode by episode, right? It's the same kind of uh, synoptic presentation. That's in um, 
the printed edition. So what's the problem with that, Paul? What's the problem with this kind of presentation? Um, well, the, the problem is it's very difficult to read. Is that what you're getting at? Yeah. 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 Um, and it's um, you have to learn the grammar of the document, uh, or at least the grammar. Well, the grammar of the document assumes um, um, a chronological succession uh, of um, of changes that are made, which are picked out by uh, those symbols, the, the 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 B, the D, and then the one. The, the two and so on. So you've yeah. got to have those in mind as you read because you're notionally trying to reconstruct five documents in your head. Yeah, I mean, it's not impossible, but it does take work, right? Mm. And I think uh, an entire generation of Joyce students who could have used this as a resource and a goldmine were kind of turned off by its, the immediate surface of its presentation format, right? So it would seem kind of pointless for us to now it's online. Now you can not look at it and not use it online. <laughs> that doesn't seem like the, the best takeaway. So what we've been doing is we've developed tools to either send you back to the documents or to uh, assist somebody who wants to use this edition but has to get up to speed with how it works. Right? And, you know, if you play a computer game, that's built in rather than go and... Who's old enough to remember when you got a manual with a computer game and showed you how to play it? Right? Now they're just built into the game. Right? So that's our goal, to build these tools in that people can use and then just turn off when they no longer want them or need them. Right? Um, so if we maybe look at... Our one is also searchable. There's that uh, paragraph I showed maybe near the start. Right? from the synoptic edition. And here's one of our tools. <coughs> so what this does is allows you to hover over any of these changes and get um, okay, not much information, but get <laughs> the information that we have on that. Well, whatever. We're not feeding in there right now. But the point of this is, there's where this information comes in. Right? Tells you this is Placard 17, the first setting. You get material information about where it's housed, and then what's on it. The extent of Ulysses that is um, printed on that, right? On that um, slip proof, right? And here's the uh, link, or um, here's the pagination in the. Uh, James Joyce archive in the facsimile edition that eventually will be used to point to uh, a facsimile in the browser. Right, but <coughs> you can move through each of these <coughs> and see that if we have the dates. Here we get some information. Right, the setters, uh, the printer setting date is 27th of September. We have a lot of this information from just the material documents, right, that are in collections uh, in Buffalo in Yale, uh, in Texas, right, and a few other holding repositories. A lot of them have things that are as helpful as a printer's stamp, right, or a date to say it's come back, right. And often the intervals are like, they're really narrow, right. Joyce is doing this work on the book. He has a, maybe a document in front of him for a few days. A run of them, he works on them, sends them back, they get incorporated, those changes into the next version of that same stretch of the book, and then that's sent out to them again. The turnover is really fast at this moment. Uh, I don't know what they must have paid in postage to get <laughs> the entire work of Ulysses multiple times to the post, back and forth between Paris and Dijon, but Sylvia Beach was uh, a very generous public <coughs> allowing Joyce to, to do all this. Um, here, I loaded this.
So our goal with that first tool is just to, while remaining in synoptic presentation, to start bringing back in material documents whose text has been abstracted in the process of this presentation, right, in the process of their synoptic presentation. So here's a tool that a colleague and I developed. We'll just paint a few lines of the episode. So what you're seeing here then, um, this is the synoptic view here, right? where you have all the same carrots and all the same little indicators of the level on which a given change is made. Right? And then above it, we just put a single version, in this case, a little like manuscript. So here you, you see everything that happened, right? And then successively here you get the different versions that lead up to that, right? Again, each one has its document flag. Oops. So if we go to something like a TypeScript, the text has been is relatively stable up to this point, right? Then you can see on each following document, so here's changes made to the placards. This is June 1921, this point. Joyce just makes a very mar very minor change, passing turns to past. Here, look at the uh, nuance, right? So the text, let's see, even the text just before that. It reads here, um, My lorries along Sir John Rogerson's key, Mr. Bloom walked soberly, past Windmill Lane, uh, the Linseed Crusher, and Postal Telegraph Office. Could have given that address too, right? It's a moment of a chair monologue. Bloom is thinking to himself, I could have given uh, an alternative address uh, for a different post office. He's going to get his letter from his... <coughs> sweetheart, let's say, uh, and passed the sailor's home. He turned from the morning noises of the quayside and walked through Lime Street. Slack hour, won't be many there. He crossed Townsend Street, passing, no, past the frowning face of, right? In its next version, he makes an insertion right after he walked through Lime Street. And he starts to give us just more detail of what Bloom is encountering as he moves through the city. Right? By Brady's cottages, a boy for the skins lulled, his bucket of offal linked, smoking a chewed fag butt, um, a cigarette butt. Right? A smaller girl eyed him, listlessly holding her battered cask hoop. Right? It's an uh, image of abject poverty, right? with children at its centre. Right? Joyce is writing this between late June and early August in 1921. So think of it, he has that large sheet of paper in front of him, right? He's zoning in on, okay, this moment of the episode, the very start of the episode. He's adding these details of place and people in Dublin. He writes that, sends it back to the printer. He gets that document back with all that material now part of the set and printed text, right? So then he further, he gets it back late August, and further nuances it, right? 
We have the material about the boy who's smoking at the end of a cigarette. Then Joyce comes in with um, an interior monologue, Bloom's reflection on this. Right? Tell him if he smokes, he won't grow. Right? And then in kind of Bloomian fashion, he has second thoughts. Oh, let him. Right? His life isn't such a bed of roses. Right? <coughs> that moment of interior monologue is um, added here in Joyce's own um, literally revision of this piece of paper, right? He has the opportunity to revisit and comment on the material that he has just written, right? He sends that to the printer. The printer says it sends uh, back the um, the changes now incorporated, and now we're in mid August and early September 1921, right? Um, he gives a bit more detail of the girl, right? The smaller girl now is a smaller girl with scars of eczema on her forehead, right? The, um, the gritty realism, right, is intensified here in this change, right? And then we get a bit more interior monologue uh, tacked on to Bloom's thoughts there. Waiting outside pubs to bring Da home. And then he voices what he imagines the boy would say, you know, come home to Ma, Da. Right. We get this building up over the course of about maybe six weeks, two months, all told, <coughs> right, on three different versions, three successive states of this part of the episode right, that allows Joyce to come back and have a, another opportunity to further augment or develop a given moment of the uh, episode. Um, that's the last change, I think, then, that gets made on it. Right? It might start to look to us that these are creative second thoughts and third thoughts and fourth thoughts on Joyce's part, right? That he's just riffing on what he has there and then. But actually it's much more tightly orchestrated than that. Um, I'll just show this image here. This is one of Joyce's notebooks for Ulysses, right? And it's, um, it's composed of these short phrasal units that are to be inserted into the work in progress. Right? Sometimes they're only two or three words, sometimes it's an entire string. Right? And the crayons, the coloured crayons are his cancel marks, right? not because he's discarding that material, but because he's actually incorporated it into the novel. Right? So that this kind of creative dynamic here right, is always fueled and draws on these notebooks for its immediate material um, basis, right? So it might be um, scars of eczema on her forehead, right? Or even a moment of interior monologue reflection, right? He's going to a previously compiled uh, storehouse of raw material to, um, to add those second thoughts, right? Our edition, the synoptic edition, has none of that in it at the moment, right? Um, this notebook here, only turned up in 2002 in someone's attic. Yeah. <laughs> um, but there are about six of these notebooks and lots of large sheets of notes. Right? So our challenge for our edition is even as we try to get it closer to some of the thing that the print volume is doing, also to yoke it to this entire system of notes and um, phrasal units that Joyce was compiling for himself. Right? These, uh, these, these notes here are gathered under episode titles, right? This is Hades, um, that's Circe, right? Here's Eumaeus, right? We're talking about thousands of short phrase of units that he reconsolates and redistributes <coughs> through his own notebooks as he tries to see, well, what's sticking together here, right? Which of these units are now becoming slightly larger building blocks that are going to be just dropped into the book in this way, right? And right now those two kind of um, spheres aren't talking to each other at all, right? So our challenge is to bring <coughs> forward what's a TEI project with something that's much more like um, a database, right? The system of organizing material. There's a further dimension to it in that these aren't always or even often Joyce's own creative thoughts. These are his commonplace notebooks. So this is his reading of 20th century print culture, 
whether it's newspapers, books, his contemporaries, scraps of paper, right, anything that he can get his hands on, he's reading and drawing short uh, units out of and putting them into these commonplace notebooks where they're totally severed from their source, right? But you can sometimes find kind of clusters of material from the oddest of uh, source texts, right? And they can do that because they have things like Google Books, mm -hmm. you know, you put these phrases into it and you find, here's Joyce reading Queen Victoria's Diary, mm -hmm. or here's Joyce reading um, Buffalo Bill's Widow, wrote a mm -hmm. work about her husband, right? The kind of oddest stuff uh, works its way through these notebooks into um, the text of Ulysses. So that's the kind of um, next phase for our work. I actually went out of time. Okay, I'll just do a final wrap up then. Um, where are we going next with some work? Uh, right, here's our slider. One of the problems with this is that it shows you all the levels for the entire episode. Right? But not every part of the book um, appears on every one of those documents. Right? So we have to kind of nuance that further. And <coughs> spare you those slides. But what we're calling, um, this is our other uh, teaching tool. It takes the alignment tables from something like uh, Collate X. Right, and uses them to reconstruct. Uh, yeah. That's just me driving it out of it. <laughs> These are just alignment tables, line by line, through the edition. Right, for the user or reader who's not familiar with synoptic presentation but wants to understand what it's trying to uh, accomplish, line by line. Right, and maybe eventually, once you're up to speed with how it works, you turn off that feature. Right. What's the name of that tool? Um, non-existent tool. Right. <laughs> right. I think it's going to have uh, an imaginative name like Level Viewer. <laughs> <laughs> We're working on it. Names are not our strong suit. Um, we've also developed this tool here that shows you This is like the document tree for a given episode, right? Right now it's just called the jellyfish. But, <coughs> yeah, that's true. It tells you what um, the source, like the parent and child for every given document, right? Sometimes there are multiple parents, sometimes there are multiple children, depending on what happens with the document. But it's our way, again, to tie what's happening here in the synoptic edition to the documents that uh, transmit it, right? And eventually we want us to work like um, this, right? So that if you highlight a change, you're seeing what document it actually occurred on, right? Which in time will be plugged to a facsimile viewer, right? So that you have a whole suite of tools or modules that are all talking to each other, right? And that the user is able to use to augment their reading of synoptically presented um, Ulysses with all of these um, components around it. Right? It's not too far off. The main stumbling block here is the legal one, of course, because a lot of that material, at least for, for Joyce, is under copyright from the middle of this century. Yeah. But it, it is possible. Right? And then our next step will be um, painting the moments of insert so that you have image text mapping on the facsimile <coughs> that shows you where that document occurs in the entire tree for a given episode, right? So that all the bits and pieces that people have found out and figured out about this massive corpus, right, can be brought to bear to hopefully help people to read and work with the edition, right? And there's just some uh, credentials if you want to uh, drive the site yourself. We leave them up for like a week, but if you do want to uh, use it after that, just let me know and we'll make the uh, credentials. There's our sponsors. Okay. Thanks. Well, thank you. Thanks. I think everyone will be fairly surprised by what they
that you've just seen and um, 